So today we have Jim Graham with us, who you might recognize from the first webinar that we did a few, I think it was two weeks ago or so. Um, Jim is a commercial editorial wedding and fine art photographer from Delaware. He started in the newspaper industry for the Wilmington News Journal. So he is very familiar with black and white film and printing in black and white. So this also kind of helped him out and became more familiar with Photoshop. Is that right? Photoshop? Yeah. Um, he was the Southern Photographer of the Year and has been twice nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. And then we also have Evan, uh, who you've probably seen a million times on our webinars already. He's our technical specialist from Moab, and he is your guy if you have anything in the world, questions about printing. So I'm going to pass it off to Jim and Evan. Hey, guys. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, Evan, I think we're going to start in Capture One. Is that right? Yes, that was one of the requests we got from last time that I think a lot of people are starting to use that and I want to know how it works. So we'll start with Capture One and then we'll do a walkthrough in Lightroom and then we'll finish in Photoshop so that then we can do a little soft proofing and print setup in Photoshop and uh, magically print some of your images from, from one <laughs> side of the country to the other. You've got my files? <laughs> um, so I, I use... It as, and we are going to go to photo, uh, to capture one. I use any number of different applications to come up with a, um, uh, a solution for what I do. And so capture one is something that I use when I am um, uh, working with, uh, and hopefully, uh, is that now, is that, do I have that up now, Evan? Yes. Good. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, I've got a number of pictures here, and uh, these are all images that I made a while ago in Cuba. And I thought that we'd start with this guy um, and um, see what we can do. And the reason I chose this is because of its color. Because it has a lot of color to it, we have a lot of versatility that we can do in Capture One and creating a black and white. So let's, when we might, might as well just dive right in. And the first thing I think I want to do is just basically do a little bit of toning in, in, in color and, and get it to where we want to do. As you can see, I've got a little bit of, uh, I'm out of gamut up in my whites up there. And so I'm just going to rescue my highlights just a little bit and bring that back till it just stops clipping. I want to open up my shadows just a tiny little bit there. And what else do I need to do? I think I'm just going, I'm not going to worry about the geometry and I'm not going to worry about the line that stretches across. I could, in Photoshop, it'd take me about, well, probably five minutes to get rid of that. And I would normally do that. Um, I'll probably add just a touch of clarity and just a tiny little bit of structure. Um, I think that this needs a little bit of sharpness if I remember correctly, and it does. Uh, so we'll go up to the sharpening tab, which is right there. And since we're already at 100%, we'll see what it does. I'm not quite as worried with about it's not tack sharpness um, in, in color. Uh, we're gonna add some noise to it to emulate the grain. And I think that probably will help that. We can also get rid of a little bit of, no, uh -uh, I don't think so. So we'll get rid of that. And let's go back there. So I think that gives us a pretty decent start. We may come back and affect some things in a bit, but so let's go and we're gonna to go to color and we're just gonna enable black and white. Okay. One thing that, that you <clears throat> subtly went past is that when you're, when you're sharpening, when you're adding grain, when you're doing any of these things, you always wanna make sure you're viewing the image at 100%. Otherwise you can grossly over sharpen it or over grain it because you're viewing it so much smaller. Now, if you remember, well, I'm actually, let's go back to this for a second. As you can see, I have blue, yellow, red. His face is a shade of red, is tan. And all of those are gonna matter when I convert it to black and white. So this is just a normal, every, you know, this is just straight black and white. But if I come down here and I move the red, channel, you can see how I can really truly affect that. 
just as if I want to brighten that yellow up some, I can really crank that up. I need to be a little bit careful because I don't want artifacting because I've done too much. There's really no green in this thing. There's a tiny, you can see it going off up in the upper corner of uh, the doorway that he is standing in. Uh, there's a little bit of green reflectance and you can do a little something about like that. Cyan, well, that affects those, those doors. So we can brighten it up or darken. I think what we wanna do is bring that red in just a touch. The blue will do a little bit. We, we want contrast here. There's really no magenta to speak of. And that's a good sort of a beginning. There's not a ton of contrast there. And don't forget that you can also affect it, I think, with this, yes. So also with your white balance. Your white balance, as you can see, will affect your black and white. It's not going to change it from being neutral, but it will affect the tones that you have, as you can see right here. See how it blows everything out if I do that? So there's that. I'll add a, uh, a pretty simple um, um, curve to this, just to perk it up just a bit. So that's up in the curves tab. And where am I with that? That's right here. I tend to, to do curves more than I do levels. Um, it's just me. Uh, the levels, although I will say this, levels in Capture One tend to be fairly useful. Um, where levels in um, uh, in Photoshop I don't use. Uh, so here it's telling me that I can I've got room for my highlight, and I'll put a little bit of a down curve on it just to get a little bit there, and I don't have a hole I go on. And I, that's not bad. And let's go back to my exposure and take it down just a touch. And it's not doing a whole lot for me, which I don't understand why. Oh, that's why. Come back to my curve. And I think what's become pretty apparent from, from working on these images is that there's really no right or wrong for black and white. There's merely a workflow that gets you to the creative endpoint you want to be, but it's, it's using similar tools in different programs to adjust these tones and, and uh, luminance values to get that image that you had in your head. I think that's, that's a big thing is there's no one way to do this and there's no right way to do it. There are different ways that yield different results, but it's not a, it's not a hard and fast recipe every time. Right, there are all kinds of ways to do this. And it's really, the tools are all basically the same, whether or not you're, whether you're working in uh, Photoshop or in Capture One. You know, you're still using your original um, image mm -hmm. in color and then tweaking the colors, using those colors to your advantage, just as, let's see, um, you know, this. So you can see the wall behind her. The, the wall behind her was, all, was, was lit. She was in shadow and there was a little tiny bit there. I could just do a quick little auto balance to see what it gives me. And it sort of saved me there a little bit. And I can come and again, just very simply, you know, with my exposure, um, all I really need maybe uh, I'll open it up just a touch because that'll give me that. And then I'm going to go with my high dynamic range and bring the whites down just a touch. Actually, and crop her too. She really needs it. Look at that. So somebody uh, was paying very close attention to your metadata in the last image and wanted to know why you chose a high ISO at f16 instead of a lower ISO at f8. Um, because back then the camera that I was using, these, these, these images are all from Cuba. And that was when we were allowed to go into Cuba. And the camera that I was using wasn't all that sharp, to be honest with you. The lens that I was using wasn't all that sharp, but I got more sharpness 
more diffraction, but more sharpness or apparent sharpness if I was shooting it that way. And so to get F16, I needed a higher ISO. Secret tips. Secret tips from the pros. Well, the th here's the thing. In today's world, I don't mind, I really don't mind a higher ISO. Back then, that was with a, what was that with? That was with a D700, I think. Let's see. Hmm, that may have been like with the, and, it, and two, it was probably really early morning and it was probably uh, in deep shade and I wanted to get all of this in and that's why I did what I did. It's more of a, again, it's a feel thing. My camera's a tool and it's how do I see it? And okay, if I wanna get everything sharp back then, I used to think, okay, gosh, I have to shoot it at F16. And it's what I did. You know, a lot of times I shoot wide open and don't shoot at F16 at all. Uh, this one, this guy right here. Uh, what did I do here? There, I'm at, th I'm a, a thousand at two eight. And so if I was going to do him again, what would we do? We'd use the Luma curve and brighten up the, the highlights just a touch, open up the, that. Let's use the levels here and pull that down just to get rid of that clipping. We open him up just a touch. This isn't going to have a lot of contrast on it. But then as soon as we go over into the black and white, we can do that. And so here, we'll enable black and white. And we can start playing with our colors. And see how we open them up and we get a little bit more shading? And Jim, you do have some questions here. Um, OK. Do you use sessions or catalog? I'm a sessions person. And I'll tell you why. So. I'm less um, interested in having that big catalog because my catalog is, I'll show you my messy filing system, but it does work for me, it works. So this is my NAS drive. And so everything, if it starts to load, you can see how I've got all of my um, files loose there. But typically you see how I've got everything cataloged? and everything dated and everything named. So for me, it's relatively easy for me to go find something as long as I know a date. And that's how I do it. I, for me, originally when I was using Lightroom, I found that it got kind of clunky and slow when I had tons of stuff in it. So I just import it into, into my NAS and go that way. And I don't really use Lightroom where Evan does. So we'll go back to that. I hope that helps. Yeah, Here. and someone else is asking, if you add sharpness during the edit, do you not then add sharpness when exporting using a process recipe? Um, no, I'm not as, you know, everybody gets really wound up about sharpness and I'm not as wound up about sharpness to be honest. I do sharpen a little bit, um, but if I'm printing black and white and I'm trying to emulate film, have has any, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm hoping people have seen uh, like Cartier-Bresson's pictures. And if you have, you know, they're not sharp. He shot at like F16. He set his, he set his camera at F16 pre-focused at a specific area so that he could get X number of feet to X number of feet in focus, not necessarily sharp, but in focus. And then he set his shutter speed uh, to a shutter speed that would s slow it down or stop it. And then he'd just go and shoot. So in this case, um, he ain't tack sharp, but I can add a little bit of sharpness to him and he's fine. I don't want to over sharpen it, but um, that's good. And then here's the other thing that you can do that I found that I do a lot. Um, if I come here and I take that brush and I go to back to that sharpness. Well, I think I can add some sharpening. Let's add a layer and add a fill layer. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to fill the mask. And now I can go in and paint and sharpen him up locally. I tend not to try to sharpen 
uh, globally, I'd rather sharpen locally. Um, this is still a little bit flat, so we're going to try and solve that. And we'll solve it here. And then, Jim, when do you decide that you want to take an image into Silver FX versus just the tools available in one of the other applications? So for me, I'm going to hide Capture One for just a second. And we're going to launch. So there's one other application that I use all the time. This is called Photo Mechanic. This, is, this application is what I use to browse all my images when I first get there. And so we'll just launch the guy that we're working on right now into uh, ACR. And so there he is ACR to me, all done up. I'm gonna overexpose him just a touch and I'm gonna bring, uh, let's go down to the calibration because he's got old school calibration on him. Good. Good. And open. So once I open him up in, in Photoshop, then I've got any number of things that I can do. I can do the same thing in Capture One. I just tend to use Photoshop a lot more, just honestly. And so now I can go and do a whole bunch of stuff here. In my case, everybody's going to look and see what I'm doing. I've got, a, I've got Nick. I also have Exposure 6. I like both of them a lot. They're both a little bit different and it all depends upon the image. It all depends upon a feel for me. So if we want to go to Silver FX Pro, how do I decide whether or not I want to use Capture One or Photoshop? Um, it depends upon the number of images I have to process. It depends upon time. It depends upon the camera that I'm going to use. I, I use uh, Nikons. I use a Phase 1 XF100. And uh, so it's an IQ3 100 megapixel camera. And I also have a Fuji uh, GFX100. Um, the Phase tends to be great in Capture One. The Fuji does really well in Capture One. But if I've only got one or two images to process, I go right into, I go right into uh, Photoshop and just use ACR. So there he is. And there's your quick conversion right there. Now, again, you can check your sensitivities. And I can do a little bit of lightening and toning there. The nice thing with this is, you know, you've got the drop down. So if I want to add, add a vignette, I can add a quick vignette. I can add a tone right here that saves me a layer um, if I want to do that. So I can get a bit of an old look and I can do burned edges and that kind of thing as well. I can do a film emulation if I want to do a film emulation as well. So all of that is, is, is very quick and simple. It's all about, honestly, it's all about speed for me. How quickly, how quickly do I need to get it done? Um, and what do I need to accomplish? So there I can target that shadow and he's done really. There's a little bit of shadow and dodge and burn. And Jim, do you print from Capture One or Photoshop? I tend to print from Photoshop. That's where for me personally, I get my best results. You can print from either. Um, there is no one right answer. Everybody's different, to be honest. Um, and I just, I tend to print from Photoshop. It's more muscle memory than anything else. I think that that's, you know, I think that that's, that's the biggest thing is to know what you have and how to use it. And again, here you go. Uh, and just all we need, all we would need to do is pull the curve over like that. And we'd be pretty ready to go. And, and I think that one really shines in black and white. Yeah. Exactly. Completely changes the, the tone and the feel of the image. And that's, that's the key, is that black and white is more, to me, is, is purer than color. 
color has subliminal meanings. So if you've got a lot of red or yellow or blue or whatever, each of those colors has a different subliminal meaning to us. And so taking that away, you get a much purer image. And in this image's case, you get an image that I think is a little bit more timeless. Mm -hmm. And I would do this. So I've just stamped it. So I have the whole image of all the things that I've done right here in that, in that layer one. And I transform it a little bit just to do, oops. let's see, edit, transform, and I just want scale. Something about like that, maybe, maybe not. I might leave it loose. The, that drain pipe on the side bothers me a little bit. So I might try to find a way to get, if I, so here's another thing. If I'm acting as a photojournalist, I leave it alone. I desaturate it, I do what I have to do and I get it to my client. If I'm acting as an artist, I can do whatever I wanna do. There are no rules, um, you know, everyone sort of, was all disappointed with a couple of different photographers that have acted as artists and done fine art photography or what we consider to be fine art photography and who have changed some of the things in their image because they had a reputation as a photojournalist. But they were selling it in a gallery and I don't, they didn't mean it to be a, as a journalistic piece. It was an art piece. And if it's an art piece, you can do whatever you want to do to it. Really? I mean, don't you think so, Adam? I do. And I think that, I hope that we're somewhat past that because I know in the first decade or two of digital, everyone was, well, not everyone. People were often suspicious of if the content had been altered at all. And, and now I think we're to the point where we understand that what we see as reportage is not intentionally altered versus what is art can be interpreted in any way because it's it's really your vision and and i i think that for a lot of folks that didn't work in the darkroom back in the day they also didn't realize how much sort of trickery was available to accomplish darkroom printers so the ability to add things or remove things or do selective exposure is is not something that came along with digital tools, it was something that was always available in the darkroom. And there are some really famous sort of forgeries in history and, and people thought they were real because they weren't expecting it to be altered, but it certainly was. The picture of Albert Schweitzer that has a saw in the lower right hand corner that W. Eugene, I think it was W. Eugene Smith made. The saw wasn't there when the, in the original image. Smith put it there. The father of photo, you know, photojournalism per se, Yep. Faked it. And, um, you know, and you need to, I mean, it happens. This particular image I've always loved. He was, this was a, he was a vegetable vendor in, uh, in Havana um, and nice guy. And I just, I asked him if I could take his picture. I think I, I butchered the Spanish language uh, and said, I think I said something like photo pro favor or something like that. And he smiled and I think he was appreciative that I at least tried and because my language skills are horrible. And so I made this quick image of him and I've always loved the image. This is it in Photoshop. Um, just wanna do one thing real quick over there. And in Photoshop, it's just a matter of going there and adding a layer just like we did in Capture One, we still have our sensitivities, our black and white sensitivities. Um, and I can do that. Remember he had a blue shirt, so I can darken that a little bit. He's got, he's got a green hat, so I can do that if I want to. Is there any cyan? No, there's no cyan. And there's no, there's a little bit of magenta back there, but I don't want to mess with that. So that would be right there, would be pretty good for what I want. That's a little bit harsh on that highlight. There we go. Um, so that's not bad. 
Now, the other thing and the other beauty of just that, we could add a tint to this if we wanted to. And I know I went quickly on that, and so I'll stop and slow down a little bit. But I can find a tint if I want by just moving that around and find a little, add, it, add a little warmth just like that. And that's not horrible. It doesn't have the structure in it that I want, but that's a good start. Um, so again, layer of black and white, adjusted the sensitivity, added a tint, added a curves layer and gave it a little bit more contrast and I'm off to the races. I could do the same thing here if I went back up and used Silver Effects Pro. In Silver Effects Pro, I have the added advantage, and I could do this in Photoshop too, to be honest, or in um, ACR too, or in Capture One, um, of adding a little bit of high structure. And you can see what that does. And we Jim, as you're it. editing this, um, somebody's wondering what, aside from getting a, a monster file that you can print gigantic, yeah. what do you see as the big advantages to using those 100 megapixel cameras? Uh, incredibly high dynamic range. I want to say that I've got 14 stops of dynamic range in the uh, phase. I've got very similar uh amounts of uh dynamic range with the fuji the fuji i think i've been using the fuji a little bit more and more uh for specific corporate clients and the smoothness of the file the ability to focus all over the screen um it's wonderful i, I really i i really have found that i like that fuji gfx a great great deal um uh, so, and two, your, your, uh, your depth of field is different than it is for a 35 millimeter. There's, there's less depth of field. So if I shoot it at F4, my backgrounds are going to go. And I tend to like to get rid of my backgrounds. I'm just going to hit OK, because that's all I needed to do with him, is just add that little bit of structure. I don't do, I don't have to do a ton. You know, if you expose well, you have a great starting point already. So you've got a great foundation image to work with. And then it's just a matter of putting a layer on it of black and white. Maybe you do a little bit of curves work. And, or if you're going to go use a different application like Silver Effects or Exposure 6, same thing. You've already got it. And boom, there it is. And I love that image. I've always loved that image. And that's 25% right there. I think I shot this with a macro lens. I know I shot this with, there I am. You can see where I am, what I was wearing, whole nine yards. And the person <laughs> that was to one side of me. Uh, so I can, just because I know that somebody was looking, here you go. There's your camera data. So I was 200th of a second at F3 at 400. I was actually using aperture priority and I was spot metering. So what I was doing was taking a spot meter reading off of his uh, forehead, most likely. And um, I would bet, although it doesn't say here, but I would bet that I was overexposing by either a third or two thirds of a stop. The reason being your spot meter or your meter wants to take your exposure to 18% gray. A typical Caucasian face is 33% gray. So in order to get it to where I want it to be, I've got to overexpose it a little bit. Um, so that's why I did what I did. I wanted to be very precise as far as what my focus was, thus F3, and I was shooting the D700. And a 105, it was, that's a 105 macro. I hope that helps. And I think we got a good question here. And, okay. and so Paul is wondering, and I think this is true that yes, he says, can you achieve all or most of the processing, you know, from Photoshop, silver effects, um, 
can you do that in Capture One so as to just use the one program? And, and for me, the answer is yes. You know, any of these programs work very well as, as standalones. I think to some degree, Lightroom is the most limited right now because you can't do layers and, and things like that. But really, it's, it's a personal preference as to what software you, you already pay for, what you're used to, what fits your workflow. And again, it's sort of like the processing. There's no wrong answer. There's just a lot of ways to do similar things with different tools. Correct. Absolutely correct. You can see here, it's even, even so this is Capture One right here. And you can even see how it rendered the file in a different way, mm -hmm. right out of the box, right, right, from the, right from the start. So you just have to be prepared to work slightly differently. Um, again, I'd add a little bit of clarity. I'm still a little worried, and I think I would have to do a little bit of brush work on his nose just to bring that highlight down. That nose, that highlight's a little bit heavy for me. Um, so I would add a layer. Um, and use the brush. And I'm just going to take the highlight down just a touch. Um, and everybody knows what with capture or with capture one, if I hit the M button, that shows me where I'm brushing. So I'm going to try and get that a little bit smooth. And Jim, as you're doing that, someone's asking why are layers important if you're adjusting a raw file? Why are because capture one you with capture one you can work in layers. I've always thought that la one layers are non-destructive. So I still have my original image right there. I, I tend to want to use layers and build up any effect that I have. See, like, I know I don't want to do that. And I, I'd rather take it down a, you know, a little bit at a time. I know that I'd add selective adjustments to everything. And for layers, that's really important. a little bit of contrast. Um, again, I don't have to do a ton here. And the great thing with Capture One, um, I think, is if I can find it right here, they, they've they got emulations too. I don't use a ton of them. And I, I you know, I don't want to pretend I use a ton of this stuff. But, you know, you just go in and you can find it and you, you're done. Um, I'd add another, and you know, you and you can add, and with Capture One as well, you can add a style. These are called styles, as a layer. It's not something I really do. Um, I'm still a little bit of a purist, so um, I probably would. For me personally, I would process this out in Capture One, bounce it over, and do whatever else I needed in Photoshop, and then print it if that's what I was going to do. And in my case, I do like to print it. And so I would go right there and go to my print. In my case, I printed this on, I want to say three different papers on the Juniper, on the Somerset Museum rag, and on, on, and, and on Entrada. I might have tried some of the washi, some of the Japanese paper, the mulberry paper that we have. Uh, and some of the texture wasn't bad with this, but in the long run, the Juniper really made this thing. It's uh, and it too, it also feels like what I was working with back in the day when I was printing on coat of bromide or on the Agfa Protriga or the Agfa Bravira. Uh, those uh, papers, you know, in today's world, that's why the Juniper is so marvelous. And do you do you find yourself printing much from Capture One or because it's what you've used forever. You're still doing all your printing through Photoshop. I still want to do my printing through Photoshop. For me, that's the right way to go. Um, it just, it's for me, it's, it's what I'm comfortable with. It's where I can be quickest and, cons and considered. Um, I, I like Capture One, don't get me wrong. I did a fashion shoot not long ago and everything I shot was Capture One. I'm gonna do uh, some work for a catalog a men's clothing catalog next week. It's going to get shot with a uh, with a Fuji, 
it's going to get uh, and the, the Fuji and the D800, the Nikon D8 or the D850, and everything is going to get uh, tethered. I'm going to be using the air, that air remote from Tether Tools and bouncing it right into uh, uh, Capture One uh, on location. Well, let's let's jump a little bit into Lightroom. Okay. And, so and go through some adjustments there. Sharing. And Evan, it should be all yours. All right. So this is a test image that we use a lot. And I put the link in the chat at the beginning. But one thing that I really like about this when you're, especially when you're starting out to work on black and white is as, as Jim was demonstrating, when you're going through the black and white adjustment, you can target specific colors. And I think when you're first getting started, that feels a little daunting. But if you start with an image like this, so we're in Lightroom, in develop, and I'm just at the top of the, the palettes here, I'm gonna click black and white. So it immediately converts it to black and white. And then if you scroll down a little ways, you have your black and white mixer. Now, the great thing here is that because this image has very distinct colors and even the trees are yellow, the berries are red, there's blue sky here. So when we go to black and white to use these adjustments, it's extremely apparent what uh, lightening or darkening, for instance, just the reds does, or if we go just to the yellows, what we can see happens with those trees. I mean, you can almost wipe them out or you can turn them into say an infrared image. So this is, this is a great way, I think, to, to kind of get comfortable with the tools and you can see immediately where the green patches are. So if you go you know, really dark or really light, you can effectively reduce any detail in that to a, a blown out shadow or blown out highlight, which can be a valuable tool depending on what you want to achieve with the image. But here we can immediately see what these tools do. You know, do we want to darken the sky? Do we want to really lighten the sky? So this is a nice a learning tool and a nice way to get comfortable with, with those. And then if we go one-to-one, -one, this is actually a small image, so it doesn't work right here. I'm gonna go back to fit. But at that point, we go 100% full size. And if you go down all the way to the bottom of your palettes, you'll see you have the ability to add grain to it and then adjust that as well. So similar as to a layer in Photoshop, you can add the grain in Lightroom. So if we want to apply that to an actual image, this is one that I've, I've printed some in color. It, to me in color, it's, it's a nice image, but I don't know, I wasn't really super thrilled with it. But the nice thing is when you convert it to black and white, and I think I will reset these. So here it is originally, and now we can do those same tools and you can see there's not a lot of red in here. I know that there's blues in the sky, so I can darken the sky for a little more drama. And there's some aquas in the river down there, so we can either darken the river or lighten it. I think it's nice if we darken it up. And then using the yellows and the reds and the oranges to adjust that landscape. Just as if you had a color filter on your camera when you were um, when you were making your initial image with black and, and white. And we often get people will ask, well, should I shoot with a color filter? And I think we agree on the fact that with digital, I usually don't because I don't want to lock myself into one specific way to edit it. If I capture it as I would capture a, a full color, then I have all of those options available to me. If I want more contrast or less contrast, or if I want to target a certain color or anything else like that. So uh, I think that I always shoot, if I'm, if I'm intending to convert it to black and white, I still shoot it as a proper color image so I have all the tools to work with. Yes, I think that, that shooting with a polarizer or uh, a, great, a gradation uh, filter, I think that's great. But putting a color filter on, unless you're using uh, a monochromatic black and white camera. No, there's no, there's no point to doing that. And, and you keep, you always work in layers because you can go back and, and edit them. And one of the things that is available in, in Lightroom is although they're not layers, 
these are still non-destructive edits. So this was an image that I worked on this morning. And when I opened it up, it had my adjustments saved, but I can easily go in and toggle those on and off or change them because again, it's not making destructive changes to the file. So I can go back and I can say, well, I didn't really like that tone curve. You know, I want to, I want to reset it or I want to change things later. So that's Lightroom still retains that advantage of additional editing and, and rethinking the image, even if well, and the you're other coming back. The other reason, and I'd add to that, Evan, is the other reason that I work in layers in Photoshop or layers in Capture One, because you can work in both places. Once you've created a layer, you can then go in and with your black or white paintbrush tool, you can then lessen the effect of that layer specifically. Mm -hmm. And so I can be far more precise versus with Lightroom, I can't quite do that. Um, I can come close, but I can't do that. Um, and I can also see exactly, you and I were talking about showing how you were adjusting your mask earlier uh, right. before we started this. And so the ability to adjust that mask to be very specific as to where you want an effect or not want an effect is hugely important for me and for my process. Um, you can do it in both Capture One and in, um, uh, in Photoshop. Capture one, two, you can target colors. And that it had that's a big advantage over Photoshop, I think. Anyway, I'll shut up now. All right. So that was a quick run through in Lightroom. If if you have any specific questions, let us know. But it's it's pretty straightforward there in the in the develop module. Very similar tools to Photoshop and Capture One and a, a similar workflow. And again, we're all just tuning these images to, to whatever looks good for us for the, for the content. And that's the biggest thing is, is that Evan has his specific artistic view of what he wants. I have my specific artistic view of what I want and what I would want for anyone is for them to find their own voice, to have their own view. I don't want you to be me. I don't want you to be Evan. I want you to be you and be the best you you can be. That said, using some of these tools that both Evan and I are using, be it Lightroom, Adobe, or uh, Capture One, or working in, some, somebody asked earlier if, if I ever used On One. I tried on one a couple of times. It sadly was just so slow for me that it didn't make any sense. Um, it, it may have gotten a lot better. I'm sure maybe it has, but at this point I'm pretty locked into my basic processes. Um, but, and Evan, you were gonna do soft proofing now too, I think, weren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So All right, so this was an image that uh, Jim magically sent me this morning and I I like it. So what what, what we're doing when we think about printing the black and white is, whereas a color image, you, know, you might be a little more concerned with, is it a warm tone paper? Is it a cool tone paper? How does it render the colors, that sort of thing? What's the, what's the overall gamut? With black and white, it's more, how deep do we want our shadows and our dark tones? And does texture in the paper enhance the image to what we were looking for or not. So starting with this uh, guy and his rooster or somebody's rooster, um, sure. things that jump out to me right away is it's got a lot of mid-tones. So we don't have a lot or really any shadow detail that's, that's critical to the image and we don't have a lot of bright whites. So my first thought on this is that I want to print it on a, a cotton rag paper because it's going to keep that subtlety. I don't want to give a lot of texture to the smooth blown out wall behind him, but I want to really captivate on the subject. So the first thing, and I think I need to share the entire screen so you can see the menus. So in Photoshop, we go to view, proof setup, custom, and this gives us the ability to do a soft proof. So for this image, I'm thinking I'm going to use one of Jim's favorite papers, the museum rag. 
And then I can choose relative color metric or perceptual rendering again, because we're not printing color and we're not dealing with a lot of out of gamut colors. This becomes a little less critical, a little less impact on the image. Um, but when you're using relative color metric, you absolutely want to turn on black point compensation. But you can see here that there's very little that changes in the soft proof when I toggle that on and off. It does brighten it up a little bit, maybe because I say simulate paper color and black ink. Uh, but other than that, it's, it's pretty similar. So I can be confident that this image is going to come out on paper almost as it looks on screen. And fortunately, it does. So this is that image on the museum rag. And it really has that, that life that I was going for. It kind of feels like I'm there. Again, this was shot in the shade, not a huge amount of contrast. So we've still kept some detail in the feathers. And because of his, uh, was it high ISO and, uh, and, and deep aperture, we have really nice detail in the eyes. But we really didn't sacrifice anything by choosing a, a cotton rag paper for this image. Whereas the, the girl that you processed earlier, in this case, we have a lot of really important shadow detail. So if we lose detail up here in her hair, or if we lose her arm, if, if this sash kind of merges with her arm, then that's something that, that we do really want to pay a lot of attention to. So we're going to go back to our proof setup. And we'll go to the museum rag. So you can see that it does, it does reduce the contrast there on her arm a bit. And so it, it we lose that separation. Whereas if we go to the juniper, which is a Beretta and holds that shadow detail a little better, we don't have as dramatic a change on that. So I'm going to go ahead and print this on the juniper. And let's see how it comes out. Jim, any thoughts or Paige, any questions we want to address while I... Now you, okay, so you used perceptual on this particular one. And would the relative color metric, and do you also want to use black point compensation uh, with the relative color metric with... Yes. The Sorry, with perceptual, the black point compensation is, is not connected. But with relative color metric, what black point compensation does with relative color metric when you check it, is it takes the shadow tones and it lightens them up to match the black point in the profile. So if you're printing on a matte paper that has a lighter maximum black, black point compensation moves those shadows so that I can print them with detail. If you turn black point compensation off, anything that's darker than the black point in the profile will just print as straight black. So you lose shadow detail if you don't turn that on. Whereas perceptual, by design moves anything out of gamut into the printable space. So perceptual will adjust those shadow tones to match the black point of the paper, whether or not you have black point compensation checked. So if it's something you don't think about all the time in Photoshop, you can just leave it checked all the time because you want it for relative color metric and it doesn't matter for perceptual. And Evan, you do have a question. Um, should you have soft proofing turned on while editing your image? I have found that if I don't, the only papers that generally show my edits closely are fiber or luster. So that's going to be more of a, a workflow question for yourself. I wouldn't necessarily want it on because then when you're editing that photo, you're not editing it sort of to a neutral preview. You're editing it to just match that one paper. Um, Whereas if you're if you're only planning to print on that one paper, then then that's not a problem. But keep in mind that then you've you've kind of designed that file to work with that one paper. So I would I would always do my initial edits without the soft proof applied, 
And then once I have the image dialed into where it looks good on the screen, then you can apply the soft proof and I would do an adjustment layer or two because generally you're going to, you're going to edit either your curves or your contrast, or maybe a little bit of, of hue or saturation to compensate for how the paper looks. But that is something to, to keep in mind. And is it important to size your image to what you want to print and keep the PPI equal to the printer's native resolution? Yeah, so we talk about this a lot when it comes to printing. And in my experience, the answer is no. I like to send the printer whatever I have. Granted, if Jim sends me one of his 100 megapixel files, I don't send that entire thing to the printer because that is a, that's a tsunami of data. But for most of our cameras, if I send the image to the printer at 500, 600, 700 pixels an inch, if I'm just making an eight by 10, the software these days is, is good enough and the processors are fast enough that it decides, the, the printer driver decides what pixels are necessary and what are not based on how that machine works. Now, granted, I work with a couple of photographers who firmly believe that sending a Canon, a 300 pixel an inch image or sending an Epson, a 360 pixel an inch image yields a better print. I haven't seen the difference. So we just disagree with each other on that. But again, if it's something, if you're doing a lot of printing, absolutely do some tests for yourself and do a, do a smaller image test, maybe an eight by 10 and do a larger image test, maybe a 16 by 20 and see if you're making that resolution exact, does it make a difference in the work that you're printing? And I would, to be honest, I would always, at least in my initial edit, edit make the file as large as I possibly can, you know, get as much out of that file as I, as I possibly can. I can always downsize it. I can, you know, and, and do that sort of thing. But what I can't do is, or at least very well, is upsize it if I've started out and edited it into a small file originally. I just would have to go back and redo the edit to make it bigger or use... And an emulation thing that makes it bigger and that never works very well. Totally agreed. And another question that, that came up earlier that I promised to address is whether to use a color profile or whether to use the black and white setting in your print driver. And this is, this is very analogous to our discussion about, do you set it to 300 pixels an inch or not? So, I like to print, and both of these prints were made using our color profile. And I like to print with the color profile because for each specific paper, the profile knows the maximum white and the maximum black and how the tones are rendered between those two points. Whereas if you're using Epson's advanced black and white or Canon's black and white photo mode, it's based on the the data from the base paper. So for instance, when I printed on Juniper on this Epson printer, I choose Baryta as the media setting. Well, Epson's Baryta setting is gonna have different parameters than our Juniper paper, even though they're very similar. So in my experience, I get a little better tones and a little smoother tonal range using the color profile versus the black and white setting. However, again, some, some photographers that I work with really love that Epson enhanced black and white or really like that Canon black and white photo setting. So um, do, you know, do some sample prints for yourself, take the same image, send it to the printer two different ways and see what jumps out at you. Now, the one kind of exception to this rule are some of the older die printers, um, the Canon Pro 100, maybe the Artisan 1430, things like that. Those have often struggled to make a neutral black and white. So if you print it with a profile, it often has a color cast. Whereas if you select the black and white setting, it restricts the printer from using those color inks or some of the color inks and forces it to make a more neutral black and white. So on some of those printers, it is advantageous to use the black and white setting. But for me, just about all the time, I want to use the color profile. And then it also gives me the advantage of if I want to tint it, I can tint it in Photoshop versus trying to tint it in the print driver and not knowing exactly how that's going to come out. Yeah, so, that, should, that probably answered Ian's question because he was asking about a faint magenta cast that he gets with the Zepson 2880 that probably doesn't owe him anything at all at this point. And um, it, that also may be his ink set. 
uh, the old 2880s had that had that issue, as I remember. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Richard uh, Peterson's asking about um, uh, how to maximize blacks uh, in, in your print. Um, and I think that that's basically editing, really, because once you get into your into your print um, in your into the print mode, you're using the um, uh, perceptual or the you know that sort of thing, and, and you're using the um, color sync to, to get you where you want to be. And he's also asking about how to show a print without glass or plexi on it. You can do it. I had a friend that did it at the Allentown Museum uh, for his Arctic show, and he did it, but. The prints all wound up getting buggered up fairly well, and he had to replace them. You know, one last one week. thing that I really like is if you're if you find glazing on your framing distracting. Um, number one is if you have control over over how it's lit, that's key. If you can have your your light hit that, you know, at a forty five or a ninety degree angle to the viewer, that makes a big difference. But also printing on a matte paper or a cotton rag, and then and then framing that, a friend of mine, I did a whole lot of prints for his office and we did it on Entrada Natural and framed those and the glass almost just disappears because you've got that nice matte surface behind it. So the print is not adding any additional reflection. It's just the glass and he has high ceilings and other things like that. So you really kind of want to target that if you have any control over it to how the print is going to be displayed and then kind of work backwards from what's going to look best in that environment. But Jim, I got your print here of the the girl from Cuba, and we were able to really keep all those all those critical things together here. So in the bottom, where we have this the um, fabric on her arm, we still have some nice separation there, and then up at the top, we still have the detail in her hair and in her face. So this is a case where because we have all that density, that Barita really makes a great looking image. Yeah, and and the beauty of it is too, it held the it held that bright highlight, and we still have detail in that bright highlight on her blouse, um, or on the headband, that, which is marvelous. That's one of the things that I think Verita does and is so beautifully. It's it is like printing on silver with silver chloride. Um, I really, you know, I think it's a marvelous paper. It really does a beautiful job. Um, Bill Clark is asking about what ink sets are we using? With my uh, Epson printers, I use Epson inks. And with my Canon printer, I use Canon inks. There's not a whole lot of, um, I don't have a whole lot of choice. Um, there used to be a, I, who was it? Zone six or was up in Newfane, Vermont. You had pisography and you could uh, clean out your printers, inks, and put in all of their black and white inks, but I don't know anybody else that makes an off-market color ink set for printers. No, and, and I really never recommend it because the inks are specially formulated to work with the heads and prevent clogging and work with the nozzles and all that sort of thing. So, you know, everybody uh, complains about the cost of ink, but with a lot of the less expensive, cheaper inks, um, you're probably going to do twice as many cleaning cycles on your printer and you might send it to an early grave. So over time, they're, they're not cheaper. Now, if you do love black and white, the, the cone inks, the carbon black inks are a great option. Granted, you are going to dedicate a printer to it. So you generally buy a new printer before you even put ink in it, you put the cone inks in it. And so that's not really going to save you any money, but it is going to give you um, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 shades of gray to do really stunning black and white. So if you're if you're really dedicated to a lot of black and white printing, that's a great that is a great option and a great way to go. Someone also asked, um, and I think this is incredibly important for everybody. Uh, they asked if sending 16-bit information to your printer was important, and I think you'd agree with me that that is just incredibly important. It if is. you're sending 8-bit 8-bit uh, information you're sending essentially 256 shades of gray to your printer. If you're sending 16 bit, you're sending 16,500 and something or other is 586, is that right? Uh, 16,000 plus shades of gray. Yeah. What that means is, is that 
where you may have a bit of a choppy transition where your, your, your shades don't quite get it when you're making your print in 8-bit, it'll be far smoother and more continuous if you do that. Um, you know, I know uh, there's one photographer uh, out west who shoots in 30, or he, he does everything so that he has 32-bit all the time. Um, HDR. So, yeah, he's doing, yeah, it really is. He makes beautiful prints, but he's got a, he's got a lot of inf information. And the, the 16 bit is even more apparent as you print larger. So once you get past 1624 into the, into the kind of the grand format prints, that's when it really shines because you have so much more space for those transitions and those, those tones. So it definitely. I, I, would, I would say that shooting, in, I mean, there's the argument about raw versus JPEG. Yeah, I, yeah, fine. But shooting in raw, I think is, you have to, just because you get much more versatility, you get more dynamic range, you get more period, and you can create a larger file with it. Mm -hmm. um, and then shooting or, and then processing in 16 bit, I think is incredibly important. Um, you could save your files as TIFFs, you can save them as PSDs or large format documents. Um, that's fine. You can always save a JPEG out of that. But that 16 bit to make a print is just hugely important. And the raw file to give you the foundation to be able to do that is hugely important. The, yeah. more, the more data that you can put through your computer and onto your paper, the better the image you'll wind up with. Perfect. Well, I think that's kind of wraps it up for questions. Um, this, this was great. We definitely covered some different ground from last time. So if you missed part one, that is on our YouTube page and page, I know you posted a link from it. So yes, this one will be in up the chat. In, uh, in a few days. And as always, send us your questions. If you have questions, send us your webinar ideas. If there's something that, that you'd love to learn more about and, and we'll, we'll get it taken care of. Yep. And then we will, Evan and I were just saying that we will post um, another Q&A coming up in May for sure. Um, but this will be, that will be on our website and we'll send an email. So that will be coming up next. Absolutely. Ask us anything. Great. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Jim and Evan. Thank you. Bye guys. Thank you very much. Bye. Take care.